Good morning, folks. Welcome to Coffee with Artists. My name is Rachel Wilkins. Delighted to be here this morning. Happy Monday, everybody. I hope you have a good cup of something strong uh, this morning. I'm delighted this morning. I have a wonderful guest, Monty Babor Jr. Monty is a Brooklyn-based artist. He got his BA at the University of Albany, and he works with recognizable images to um basically express generational conflict. So Monte, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here this morning. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, welcome. So you grew up in Brooklyn. Um, you were born in the in the late 80s. Tell us about being a kid in Brooklyn during those days. What was life like? Uh, man, um, life was, uh, for, for, to start off, life was very fun. <laughs> you know, life was very fun up until you know, a certain age, you know, you started to witness things that, you know, that was going on in your communities. Like, for instance, I, I saw some some of the first the dark, some of the first uh, notable things I've seen was when I was uh, six years old, um, uh, just seeing separation, the separation of my parents and then seeing mm. how we had to, you know, manage living, how like witnessing my father worked numbers of of jobs at night and um and uh you know just just having to i guess i guess having to 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 learn how to be patient learn how to be patient at a very early age so um i mean it oh but but overall it wasn't just dark clouds or anything like that um in 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 the midst of all that um a lot of creativity was born, you know, just um, me being the last of four of four children and um, being being a son of, you know, two parents that uh, that that come from a background of themselves, like being a professional soccer player and my mom being a, a designer and even my grandmother being an entrepreneur in selling clothing in Jamaica and stuff. So um, all these things kind of just trickled down to me, you know, my influences from my older sister and my two older brothers really kind of set me on the course of, you know, this curiosity and, and, um, and, uh, you know, just experimenting with things. Yeah. You were the youngest of, of four growing up. It sounds like a busy household. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was busy. It was busy and, uh, there was a lot of noise. Um, but at, at, at the same time, I, you know, it's necessary noise, you know, um, you know, my oldest brother, uh, I think he's about 15 years older than I am. Um, and uh, he at the time, uh, in the early late 80s, early 90s, you know, the kind of uh, the, the this, the I guess the roar or the volume of hip hop was starting to take its course and, you know, starting to gain like mainstream attention. So, you know, I like he was a a teenager amongst all that, you know, and uh, while being teenagers, um, my oldest brothers had like experiences with um, the 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 kids making the noise in the hip hop culture and um, that coming that happening in school and then coming back home to the household, you know, just uh, everyone sharing music that, you know, is at the moment rare, you know, it's just rare to share, you know, the, the creativity is uh, the creativity of others um, back then, but you know, being able to be a part of that, it um, yeah, it really, it really established the voice in myself right now. You know, yeah. that uh, now that I'm understanding and now that I'm getting older, it's it, it, I'm starting to understand the things that you know were the foundation of who I am now. Yeah. So, you know, I also have a, a sibling who is 15. We we have a 15 year age gap. My brother is mm -hmm. uh, 15 years my junior. And um, oh. it's always fun because I think we, you know, you, you influence each other in ways that, you know, you wouldn't normally get with kind of closer siblings because we, there is such a generational gap between the two, the two, um, the two of us. Um, mm -hmm. Are you close to your brother and did you draw from any of, you know, his influences? Do you still draw from any of his likes and dislikes today? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I, I draw from all my all my siblings mm -hmm. i draw from my 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 oldest brother damien my second oldest chadwick and my 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 older sibling right above me um my sister antonia um i draw you know what little well let me give you a backstory if i can <laughs> you know so 
<laughs> um, I don't want to rush through it or anything, but um, but yeah, at the at the age, like I like I said before, at the age of six, um, I, I started to experience real like heavy, heavy emotions. You know, dealing with the separation of my parents, um, and with that, you know, came the I guess the the exit of my two older siblings. You know, um, my oldest my oldest sibling, uh, he went away to school, and you know, um, my my second oldest, uh, Chadwick, he, he, uh, he, he left the house and went back to his father's, um, house, you know, that, and, and what was left was my sister and I, but over the years, um, you know, what stuck with me, although we were separated for, for a, a, a long amount of time, um, what stuck with me was the, the good moments you know, the, the laughter, the, the games, like, uh, um, my oldest brother is the funniest person you, you'd ever meet. It, uh, he used to do this thing when we were, uh, kids, he used to do this thing, uh, when it was time for us to go to sleep, my father would actually, uh, come in the room and make sure like the TV was off and nobody was awake and everyone was in bed, <laughs> in bed and everything. Right. So, um, the TV's off. My oldest brother goes, he, he starts to play, um, starts to make a lot of noise under his covers, just bumping the sheets and punching the air in, in the sheets. And it looks like hundred of people, hundreds of people are under the under the sheets. And uh, he'd be, he, it'd sound like a club in there. And he'd go, he'd take his head out. He'd say that a, a rapper was in here. You guys are missing it. And then he'd put his head back into the covers and go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And then he'll come back out and he'll say, yo, you're missing it. Like Diddy's in here or Biggie Smalls is in here. <laughs> you're missing it. Like he'd play games like that. And those things kind of, um, it, it, it helped, you know, things small, small moments like that. There were many more, but small moments like that kind of helped build, you know, my character and kind of helped build this playful side of myself. And, um, it, it helped bring, it helped bring, uh, for you know this creativity and it also it also gives me gives me a starting point to restart a relationship with my older siblings you know as i got an older i i'm able to contact them more it's my responsibility now to contact them more so that we can keep that tighter relationship but yeah they've my older siblings have influenced me beyond you know beyond recognition really <laughs> that's wonderful yeah. So you, you mentioned play there a little, you know, talking about being playful and, um, you know, discovering your creativity. You yeah. did address some very serious topics in your work, and we're going to, you know, we're going to kind of get to that. But I'm okay. curious to know when you, at what age did you realize that you had something to say and that you wanted to use artwork or art to express that? Do you remember, uh, what, Do you remember like, what, a key moment? Uh. Let me see. Let me see. I well, I knew I. I guess I guess I knew I always had something to say. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't. You know, I'll give you the age. Let me see. I'd say uh, about when I was nineteen. When I was nineteen, that's when I really, like, I guess I was reaching the tipping point of years of internalizing. <laughs> you know, so um, uh, when I was 19, I realized that I had something to say, but I just couldn't articulate it. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, my, my, my emotions were far beyond my years, you know, and that speaks on two, in, on two levels because I was introduced to these emotions at a very young age and I had to grow living with these emotions, not really understanding what they are um, up until I, you know, reached 18 and then you know from I'm, I'm turning 33 now but um for for that duration from 19 up until now i i can see that you know everything that i did you know i in in my old pieces i had you know i used to do street art um mm -hmm. i had uh, i used to do balloon stencils with smiles on them um in soho and uh and me packing and and i didn't quite know what meant I had, you know, behind that, but I knew I wanted to say something, you know, 
I knew I wanted to say something as and as time went on, I, I guess, you know, the messages were me understanding my messages from way back were kind of retroactive, you know, where I, you know, the balloons and the smiles pretty much stand for my understanding and standing for, you know, just uh just trying to get through your day to day, just trying to get through the next year, just trying to get, you know, to your goals without giving up. And that balloon is something to kind of keep your your happiness up. Kind of like how, uh, for instance, if you had a kid in a room right now and he's crying, if I, I, I bet you if you blew a balloon up and you tied a string on it and gave it to him, he'd be fine. You know, like that's, I, I feel like that's the message that stood behind that, that piece of work, you know? And um, I feel like as I get older, I'm starting to understand the things that I do starting to understand my actions and each year I get closer to my understanding and then you know now I can kind of predict and could kind of uh, prepare myself for any decisions that I make moving forward and now I can explain my pieces you know so yeah. It sounds like you've been on a, a journey of self-discovery from a pretty long young age. <laughs> what? A lot, a lot yeah. of uh, things to experience as a six-year-old, you know, to go through all those things and to be able to kind of come out of it with, with a voice is, uh, mm -hmm. is is really something. Can you remember, because I'm thinking about, you know, Brooklyn in those early days in the in the late 80s, it was kind of the, the uh, tail end of the real graffiti movement in New York, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, they started to kind of clean up a lot of the, the street writers' uh, work that was on the trains and the subways around mm -hmm in the 90s can you remember having any heroes or following any particular taggers or graffiti artists in those early days oh uh actually uh no no i i didn't follow any taggers i didn't follow any um well well let me let me paint the picture when in the 90s where where i grew up I'm t I'm actually living in the the same area. I came back mm -hmm. after years of not being here. Um, uh, I grew up in the Nostrand East in East Flatbush on Nostrand and Erasmus, and um, this area was. Well, you look at it now. If you take a picture from back in the '90s, you look at it now. You you you'd be hard to tell the difference. The same Chinese stores there. You know the same. You know. Uh, Church Avenue looks the way it still does. You know, it's just kind of you kind of see, you kind of see the markets. You kind of see the food. Like this, this place has had a a type of community for a while. You know, and all communities have good. In, you know, in all in in some bad. But uh, in regards to street art, street art, the trains were the trains were still tagged up. <laughs> I remember, I remember seeing the trains being tagged up. I remember seeing a lot of tags and. And um, actually, uh, uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't understand what the tags were because it, it wasn't much of any art to the tags. Yeah. It, it was more so, this is where I'm from, or this is the, the street art wasn't considered street art. It's like, it was, it was uh, a, this is my territory <laughs> type of tag, you know, and, um, I'm lucky enough to to even take it further and 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 do something a bit more creative with you know that kind of medium and uh but as uh, I wouldn't say there's any art uh, or any artist that influenced me to do that um the street art of course there I I know that there are artists and po possibly they they and maybe they've slightly influenced me or so but I couldn't. I couldn't really sit behind and say that man. That person really wanted me to do it. I, really made me want to do it. But um, but yeah, I I just did it because I I wanted my message to be heard. I wanted to. I wanted my voice to be heard. I wanted to be seen. You know, I wanted to be seen, and I felt like people weren't giving me the opportunity because I didn't fit an image or a perception that they were being fed. If you, you know you know what I'm saying so yeah so in your series several several seats yes you borrowed characters from the iconic 90s show the Simpsons and 
you you've taken these characters but you've kind of treated them in a way that's very subdued you've taken that kind of uh really bold yellow out of the picture and instead have this much more gentle soft palette you share that this series is a com to comment on a conversation about generational trauma tell us why you chose the simpsons uh so I chose The Simpsons because I love the car. I love the, the 90s. The Simpsons in the 90s is a bit different than how it, how it is now. Mm. You know, um, I feel like in the 90s, there was a bit more emotion to the storytelling. There was a bit more um, like groundedness to uh, to uh, to the characters. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't so kitschy. Um, but um, the reason why the reason why I chose it is is because I, it, it, even going back to what I said about how sometimes messages come to me recto, retroactively, mm. you know, um, seeing The Simpsons and choosing to do it, I just felt like it, it was a part of my childhood. And as someone who's uh, becoming an adult male or or someone at the time that was becoming an adult male, I, I um, I saw that this would be a good tool to to start the healing. You know, this may I started to think of Simpson episodes, and when thinking of those episodes, it would take me back to the day or the day where something significant happened in my life outside of the cartoon. Mm -hmm. You know, as as a child, um, like for instance, as a child, I loved The Simpsons, and um, I thought about it all the time. But it brought me me thinking about The Simpsons brought me back to the first time I learned how to tie my shoe. You know, um, and that in itself is a story, and I want to <laughs> that that runs off on a on a whole you know in a different topic. But um, I just saw that. Each time I chose a character, like for instance, Marge, Marge rep to me, Marge represents my mother, you know, at, at a time where uh, I need someone to show me who I am or I needed someone to show me who I am. My mom was there, mm. you know, uh, my father, my father fell sick. He, he fell ill. He had a stroke uh, years back and he recently passed, but through that, um, through my father having a stroke and through his passing, my relationship with my mom has become stronger. And she's really been this, she, she has really been this vessel for me to, to, uh, to understand myself, you know, as an adult male and to understand my father and to understand who she is as a person. And by doing that, it gave me an understanding that she has had her life experiences that brought her to her decision making. And I have had my life experiences that brought me to my decision making. Some of her decision making were good, some of them were bad. Um, some of my decision making was good, some of my decision making uh, turned out to be bad. And, um, and that really gave me insight to put the stones down, you know, so to speak. You know, I I myself have, you know, have things that I need to take care of. And I have to understand that, you know, she has has had for years things that she needed to, to take care of. Mm -hmm. And it and it'd be beneficial for myself to to forgive her and to understand that people go through their 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 trials and go through their struggles because it, it, you know me by me understanding that it helps me build a relationship with her and by me understanding that it helps me build a relationship with myself as well and to you know better prepare myself as i get older and as i grow and deal with adulthood so me using each character represents you know that experience. So me using Marge as the heading, the, the leading character is a, is, is a reflection of my mom telling a story. 
and um, me choosing to to pick particular characters like uh, Monty Burns or um, who else? Who else did I do? A Sideshow Bob, mm -hmm. uh, who is crazy, Sideshow Bob, <laughs> you know. But Monty Burns in particular represents this ideology, this man who, this stubborn man who, um, who is so egotistical and so competitive that even when wrong, he doesn't, he doesn't choose to make the right decision. And that I think is a broad reflection of many people, you know, including myself. So that's, um, yeah, that's the reason why, um, or that's how I tied in the use of the Simpsons, you know, using that to explain a, a larger picture yeah. that to kind of reflect us because in the nineties, like I said, the Simpsons were a bit more warmer and grounded than they are now. There was, certain, uh, there was a certain steadiness to them, to that show right throughout. I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, but you know, mm -hmm. I remember just hearing that music and you know, it was very comforting when you heard the Simpsons music. You knew, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, you, knew yeah. You, you had an hour ahead of you where you could just kind of switch off. You yeah. Know, it, yeah. Something that I just thought about when you were sharing about having this, this compassion for your mom when you you know you, you hit a certain age and I, I've often wondered if we have some kind of empathy gene in us that doesn't kick in until we hit 30 because I kind of went through something <laughs> similar like you know my whole life I was like angry at my parents and like uh, you know all the way through my 20s and then I, I hit 30 and I had empathy I'm like you yeah. know their experience was their experience and they made did the best that they could and Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting that we don't get to that point until we hit a, kind of a certain age where we appreciate yeah. what they, you know, what their, their life life choices and their decisions. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I I see it. I see that as a saving grace. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I I think that I think that if you're able to see that, then you're able to break a number of cycles. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you if you know, I, I was able to sit down and listen to my mom's story and she went through, you know, her relationship with her father, her relationship with her mom, her relationship with my father. And, you know, prior to all of that, I had I've had I was lucky to, lucky enough to have a conversation with my father, you know, um, and even then I was still I was still a little bit too young to to quite understand, you know, what he was actually talking about. But I think um, adding my mom to the equation gave me a, a, a complete picture of what they went through, you know, and um, by doing that, you know, I can, I can, I can end the, uh, the cycle for my son, my daughter, or whoever I, you know, mm -hmm. whoever I bring into this world. So, you know, that's the saving grace to me. So tell us a little bit about your approach to the, to the work um, stylistically. Do you, um, have kind of a, a methodology to you, to your practice? Are you somebody that needs to get in the studio or have a sketchbook every day, or do you wait for this divine inspiration to strike before you take your ideas to uh, to the canvas or to the paper? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I do a little bit of both, mm -hmm. a little bit of both. You know, um, I don't leave it all on the hands of div divinity, <laughs> you know, but uh, and I don't, I don't spend too much time, you know, creating the, the proper environment for myself. Um, uh, I, I have a, I feel like I have a, I have a very even balance in doing the two. Um, let me see. Uh, I just, you know, let, I've decided to let things come to me mm. at this point in time in my art, my, my artist career. I've, de I've decided to let things come to me just as they are in life. Mm. You know, um, I can't force a message. And I have, I, I put value in the, in, in the work that I do, not to question or even knock anybody else's, you know, uh, or, or how they prepare their stuff and, and, and how they create. But for me, for me, I have to, I have to make sure that what I say 
what I say or what I create, I have to make sure that I critique it to the point of, yeah, there's like, it's to the point where it's airtight, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so if an idea comes to me, I'll think of the idea. If a, uh, I think of it, I'll think of the idea and I'll just go back to my I have folders of, you know, other artists that inspire me or other artists that are, that are like me who are working in um, in an appropriation style of, you know, art or art making. Um, I'd look into what they're doing and I'll couple it with an idea that came to my mind or, you know, I'll through listening through listening to a TED talk, I would you know, start conversations. And by starting conversations, I feel like I'm organically creating this, I, you know, these, these visuals and these concepts by qu constantly questioning myself. So I don't, I don't, so uh, I don't do much of any, much of any preparing around a thought. I really just let it come to me. And that's not me just sitting around I'm always actively thinking of like, you know, things that I can create because I just want to create. I think that's just a part of that part is, you know, innate in me. But um, yeah, I just, I, I just make sure that, that, you know, whatever I create, not like I did when I was younger, but whenever I create, uh, I make sure that it comes to me organically. And, you know, I make sure that I question myself before I put it out, yeah. So your work, you talk about your work being uh, a way to personify societal experiences and generational conflicts that shape the conversations that are impacting today's culture. Mm -hmm. We are in the middle of what feels like a defining moment um, for racial inequality, for social justice. You know, it's such a topic that just runs so deep in the bedrock of American culture, race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how are you feeling right now, first and foremost, in this moment, and how are you? How is this impacting you as a creative person? <laughs> Man, um, so so everything that's happening, everything that's happening is really, really heavy. I've I've broken down a number of times. Uh, through this experience. And, um, you know, I've, I feel as though, you know, I've been working on, you know, the, I've been working on visuals for a while that focus around, that's around the conversation, um, dealing with, uh, societal, societal issues and, and, uh, conflict, generational conflict. And I, and like I said before, retroactively, the messages are coming, coming to the forefront. Um, for instance, uh, before any of this happened, before the the COVID COVID nineteen, before you know all the the protests and the riots, uh, I I noticed that it was our it was our first time. It was the first time that anyone has known life to be anything else than what it has been since we were, you know, born on this planet. And, and in doing, in doing so, I noticed myself, like my messages, my message, my messages of, uh, of generational conflict of, of archetypes and individuals in my art we're, we're starting to make a bit more sense. Mm. You know, like uh, I, I said, Monty, Monty Burns. So I brought up Monty Burns earlier and he's a representation of Trump. He's a representation of, uh, and Trump is a representation of our government, sadly. You know, uh, all he did was at, at when, when everything happened, what happened was a mirror was raised or everyone that was in the way of the mirror um, moved out the way and we got a better, a better reflection of our government. We got a better reflection of ourselves. We got a better reflection of who Trump is. And 
like I said about Monty Burns, you know, it's weird to bring up a cartoon character in this moment, but um, like I said about Monty Burns, this is an opportunity for, for us to, to, to put an end to the, to the habits. You know, for me, for me, this whole entire experience gave me an opportunity to sit with my habits, to sit with my thoughts, to sit with, sit with myself and make a better plan for myself coming out of this. You know, and I think a big part of, of what's happening is the continuation of, of habits, like racialized patterns, police brutality, you know, um, prejudice, prejudice in and out of the, uh, the, the working, the workforce. Um, and also gives us a, a, a it, it, it makes us want to reflect on how we're, how we're treating one another, how we're treating one another and, and, um, breaking that is the most important part. And I feel that, you know, this, this has affected my art and for some time. I was just sitting, I was just sitting, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get a thought out. I was just living in every single moment. I didn't, I didn't turn the news off. I was going to sleep very late. I was missing meals. I was eating cereal, standing up and, and walking around with my thoughts. I, you know, I, my, my, my heart, I had anxiety attacks. I, you know, it's, it was just, it was just a lot happening. It was a, and there was a lot of noise going on. So I couldn't do much. But today is a different day. And um, today I've been able, you know, going to the protests, I've been able to, to, um, to now reel in all these emotions and kind of control what I'm feeling and what I know now. You know, um, my older brother used to tell me, he used to say, my older brother Chadwick, he used to say, um, he used to say, uh, I have some books that I want you to read, right? And I'd ask him about a particular book because I liked the way the cover looked. And, and um, he would say, no, 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 you're not ready for that yet. And I'm, I'm like, it's a book. It's like the book that you're about to give me. But I, in that moment, I understood what he was telling me. Sometimes, you know, certain books, certain books aren't meant to be read at a certain point, at, at, at a certain point. Sometimes you have to be ready for the text that's in it. And um, not to, I'm not saying that I was ready for this, but I, I think that, you know, serendipitously me being born in the 80s and this happening now has given me the, I guess, the, uh, the ability to put aside a rational thought and sit and sit with the moments that are happening right now so that I can break it down and understand this is the, the most heaviest thing that has happened in my life. And I think for anyone, <laughs> for anyone, this is, it's, it's unreal. I'm looking at movies that you know, are, are sur that surround the theme of apocalyptic moments. And I'm like, nah, that's not realistic enough for me. You know, this moment, this moment in time has given me, it's been hard, but it's also given me um, the, uh, I guess the conditioning to move forward and find uh, new aesthetics. And I feel it and it's coming, it's coming. I can't wait to show you guys, but, um, uh it's it's been it's been hard it's been hard you know i can go on for for hours you know talking about the many ways and the the many ways things need to be different you know and how how um how all artists need to be treated treated and how black artists need to be seen and how 
how much and how we're not a monolith in aesthetic in attitude in spirit we all have different approaches to to our work and um and uh yeah this this uh this experience has just opened my eyes to a number of things and it's made me stronger in in doing that yeah you know you talked about covid and you know we we have been locked down for what feels like forever mm -hmm. how did it feel to go from being in this you know, kind of isolation situation to being amongst these thousands of people who are fighting you know, going to the streets, putting your your personal safety at risk because this is such a prevalent, um, you know, defining moment in time. How how did it feel to be amongst that crowd, and what was the energy like there? Uh, man, it, we uh, me and me and my girlfriend had this uh this um uh conversation the other day, and um there was a there was a lot of emotions going on um while at the protest you know uh so two two times two times being at at the protest the first time we woke up step outside our door it's right it was right there <laughs> and um you know at first for me it was it was difficult to to follow it because at the moment at the moment um all we saw we didn't see we didn't see black people leading the protest yeah. so my emotions told me that i cannot go through with the protest i cannot go through with the protest because i'm not sure i i'm not sure if i can follow these people that's how hard it was you know to, to stand in that at first. The second time, uh, you know, the second time you have all, well, the first time you had all these thoughts, am I going to get beaten up? Am I going to get, you know, maced? Am I going to have a rubber bullet shot in my face? Am I, you know, you, you, you think of all of these, all of these things that, that are happening, that are happening on the news and you're thinking of it happening to you and this is right outside your door. And, and on top of that, you have six helicopters flying in the sky. Now, mind you, this is the same day they sparked, they, they, uh, they launched SpaceX. So <laughs> this, yeah, this, it, it was, it was it, you saw two different skies. And me being the artist that I am, I saw two different messages. And for me, the message was, <laughs> I have a video too, <laughs> the message was, um, the message was the concern is not is not getting black people out of space black people beyond the sky's limit the, that was the message to me on one end and the other end where the helicopters were flying and the moon was in the background it it showed that you can only dream of that you can never attain that so that was the first day <laughs> that was the first day and it felt it was crippling it was crippling you know and uh, for a couple of days we were just trying to find out ways to um to be happy you know to just like to to, to laugh and smile and you know i bought us skateboards and you know just so that we can we can feel we can feel some wind you know, so feel some wind, and um, and uh, uh, it, the second, the second time, you know, I just put everything to the side. I was like, I told myself, if I'm gonna stand here, if I'm gonna walk with this person that's by me, they may not look like me, but they're here with me. My eyes, my eyes are on what they're doing, but if they're on this ride with me. Let's go forward. Let's keep marching. Let's fight for what we know is right. So, yeah. Something so, I have thought about that, you know, the idea of white people protesting, which mm -hmm. obviously is 
necessary and about time um, that it that it would be challenging to to stand shoulder to shoulder with the very people that have oppressed you for mm -hmm. generations. For generations. I, I I hear you, and I you know we we want to learn too. And, you know we want to learn and make sure that you know what we are doing is is appropriate and it, it is you know respectful. Um, but, you know, that's not the job of black people to teach us how to do that. We have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. how do you reckon with the fact that because of systemic racism, you know, you inherently have to fight harder, work harder, be better to get a seat at the table? Like, how do you reckon with that? Um, so uh, it's funny that you say seat at the table. Um, because that's that's really what uh what's behind you know i do more than just the simpsons i'm even working on some projects that have no involvement with the simpson theme but that theme is so important to me because it's connected to my life vein you know and um the the seat at the table uh, mention it relates to the simpsons you know I, my aesthetic is pulled from uh, uh, Solange, you know, Solange, Solange Nolens, Nolens? Yeah, so Solange, yeah, yeah, she has, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, I think in 2017, I think, uh, she came out with uh, the album Seat at the Table. And a Seat at the Table uh, essentially through through my understanding is an album that discuss that 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 uh um that addresses that addresses uh systemic racism and it, it it addresses generational conflict it addresses all these things that revolve around the struggles that black people had to go through um in this country while you know uh while dealing with white supremacy uh for me as an artist, it has been a constant struggle, not just, not just as an artist, but just, you know, as a, as a human being that it starts, it starts from my childhood. It starts from, you know, uh, uh, and, and a lot of times for years, for years, I just, uh, I feel like I've been saying things like this to people and, you know, it hasn't been striking a chord to anyone it's kind of you know yeah i hear it i hear this i hear this all the time i hear that all the time yeah 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 it's happening it's happening it's happening but i don't think people understand the severity to which it's happening you know um you know there are people where people out out on the street right now that that are angry and they've, they've been there have been people out on the street for 11 days just just yelling and just you know just just standing for what they believe in and um and i've i've experienced you know all of all of this in 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 micro levels you know like me being in high school being a high school basketball player i don't have being a basketball player period if you are black you don't have the opportunity to be to be a a media a, a, a mediocre um player you don't have the opportunity to just be a regular basketball player that can pass the ball and just you know play a organized game you have to be this extraordinary michael jordan magic johnson lebron james steph curry type of individual and i think that has a lot to do with what with what is being depicted in the media you know and and when i say when i say media i know a lot of people hear this when I say media, I don't necessarily mean just journalists or, or anything like that. No, it's the way that we hold our black stars up to this, to this pedestal. The way that we hold our black stars up to this pedestal is being perpetuated in the media. And when you perpetuate a message in the media, you start, I, I feel that those who are not in the culture, uh, uh, non, uh, non-black and white individuals, those who are not in the culture and not understanding of, of, uh, black people in general, I feel like they, I feel like media has convinced them that 
this is blackness, that this is the standard, that we are the monolith, that we, that we are all extraordinary. We are all extraordinary. But the thing is, media tends to, 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 uh, to lift just a couple of few. You know, they would call them the exceptional ones in, in certain movies that that speak about um, that speak about slavery and all and all these things happening. And I feel I feel it's very important. It's very, 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 very important that white individuals, non-black individuals, take the time to to seeing or take the time to taking take control of the media that's being fed to you. And I think that we need to do that as a society all together. It's too it's too easy for media to make our own decisions for ourselves. I wake up I I woke up one morning this week to black screens. I'm like, when did <laughs> why why is this happening? You know? But the thing is, we have to we have to take control of how we're receiving our information and also we have to we have to take responsibility in researching. We have to be accountable for the information that we're we're having and making sure that we're getting the correct information. We're making sure that we understand that there are more there 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 are different kinds of artists that are out there. There are different kinds of basketball players that are out there. There are different kinds of singers, different kinds of scientists, different kinds of people. These individuals, we, just like white people, we have every individual that can fit in every category. And I think in society, we don't see that. We, we especially when it comes to black people. You know, I, I found it really hard to, to really get in a position right after right after uh college you know right after college I, I i went straight to you know the galleries to try to be an assistant or you know the galleries to be an intern or something like that and i had friends from college who were not black who had the same amount of work same you know same uh, we had the same gpas we had all these kinds of things the same kind of same amount of experience some you know some of us are better than uh, uh one another in some things but the thing is the thing is when i stepped out when i left to go into the workforce you know the career that career path i had to i i, I damn near had to be basquiat in order to get any attention you know, my art had to look like his. My art had to, you know, I had to have uh, to, to someone, I, me having dreads was, because at, at the moment I had locks. So me having, me having locks gave someone, oh, he's an artist and he has locks. I want to see what he's about. But the, 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 but the disappointing factor to them was that I wasn't the artist that they expected. I wasn't the raw Basquiat that they expected. I wasn't the raw, you know, whoever that they expected. I wasn't, I wasn't good enough because I wasn't myself. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of. Right, almost as though you're expected to play this, this black character that they've imagined in their mind. Exactly, exactly. And it's, and it's, it's easy to catch. It's easy to catch. I'm not speaking in an irrational manner or, or, or anything, or I'm not upset. It's just, I'm just pointing out the patterns and it's easy to notice the patterns when you've gone through it so long. And you can see, and when you've gone through it so long, you can see the racialized patterns, you know, on all, on all levels. And sometimes, and I think because it's gone, this has gone on so long, it's no longer just a, 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 white, a white and black thing. You know, it's, you know, because there, there's, there's a Latino, Latino officers that are abusing, you know, black people. There are black officers that are abusing black people. I think this is, this is, this has gone on too long to the point where now it's ingrained in the minds of individuals, you know, this perception of their own, you know what I'm saying? So 
you know, as an artist, I think it'd be it it'd be beneficial for and this this goes out to uh uh uh, uh you know these the gallerists that are 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 in Soho or you know anywhere like we black artists are not a monolith we have so many when we've proved it over time and we've proved that as human beings that we can touch on different kinds of categories we just have to give each other the time we just have to give each other the shot and the opportunity to do so a real shot a real shot you know not just for not just for a day or so not just for a month not you, you know just a, a real shot at it because what i've noticed what i've noticed those who those who are who are hungry to learn they become more than than we than we expect we can't we can't create we can't foresee what someone will become but if you get if you give them the the right the right experience if you give them that if you give them just the bit that they need just the attention that might go miles that might go you know that might go so far but yeah that's <laughs> I can go on on about this for days, but it's a huge topic, and I, I recognize yeah. that we don't have huge amounts of time, but it's so yeah. it's just such a defining moment right now that you know we we have to talk about this, and I think it's the more conversations that we have, the better we can begin to understand you know what needs to what needs to be done to to you know to force the spring to to make change, you know. When I was doing my research, I noticed that you mentioned a, a TED talk by Carolyn McHughes about the art. Oh wow! Of, the art of being yourself. You know, if you could go back today and have a conversation with that little six-year-old that was, you know, contending with all of this uh, upheaval in his world, what would you, what would you tell him? So, uh, so wow! I I didn't had no clue, I had no clue that you did uh that amount of re research. <laughs> but um, but um, I mean uh, I well, you're you're talking about a video. I'm right currently. I'm working on um, you know, just cleaning up my website and you know, um, creating videos and getting back to the swings, getting back to the swing of things. Sorry. Um. So. So that that concept of telling myself, my younger self, what um, uh, uh, you know, telling my younger self, giving my younger self information, uh, surrounds you know, this idea of who I am now, you know, or just the person that I am now, and you know, in response to your question, uh, I, like I did in the film, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't say anything. I just listen. The re and the reason why I wouldn't say anything is because I'm proud of the person that I am now. Mm. You know, I'm that, and the person that I am now went through everything that that person is going through and that person will go through. So, you know, I just felt, I just felt like doing a project that, you know, is kind of sharing, sharing sharing a message to people that be proud of who you are, be proud of who you are and, 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 and understand that you, you're going to go through hard times. You're going through, you're going to go through good times. You're going to make bad decisions and you're going to make good decisions. But, you know, you, when you get, when you get older, you, when you get older, you're going to understand that, the person that went through all of those things that you that you experienced the person that went through that needed to go through that so that you can do what you're doing right now in the moment that you're in and i'm talking i'm talking from from personal experiences um i just feel like i just feel like we we need to we need to go through life so that we can talk so that we can give something to someone else to hear so that we can share um, an experience to share how life, how life goes and how, um, and how sometimes a plan 
a plan isn't what you need. Sometimes you just need, you know, sometimes you just need to go through some things to see where you need to go. Before you dance off. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So you talk about generational trauma and generational conflict. Um, you know, how, what have been some of the discoveries that you've made as you've worked through that? That have perhaps, um, informed, you, perhaps informed how you create or informed how you live your life? Um, generational conflict. Uh, generational conflict is in, in generational uh, trauma. I, I discuss those things uh, so that you know it can better it can better ease the uh, I guess the 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 pain you know like like just understanding that. Uh, that the traumas, the traumas are are the things that got you here. And if you're if you're able to identify that trauma, identify that conflict, you know, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's easier said than done. But it's it's just good to know that that's your opponent. That's that's standing right in front of you. You know, that 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 opponent that you need to face. And that opponent that you you may need to harness in, because sometimes we sometimes we the things that we experience make us who we are, mm -hmm. and we and if we're able to reel that in, it's kind of like I, I hate to make an, a, a comparison, but um, it's kind of like being kind of like uh, taming taming your wild side, your, yourself, you know, if you're able to tame that person, because this person is who you are, if you're able to tame that person, you're able to move forward and, and, and break certain cycles. Like, uh, like, for instance, poverty, poverty made me very upset, <laughs> you know, in, in hindsight, you know, going through um, uh, being, being homeless and being in communities where violence is, is up you know, uh, a, a certain percentage, you know, I, I, the first time, the, the first time I experienced someone shooting in my home was when I was nine years old, you know, and that was at my father. That was at, that was towards my father during the night. And that right there just sends you down this path where you just, you're just on edge. And, um, Sometimes you're, you you might find yourself at a fork in the road, and you have to make that decision in that point. You have to understand that there's going there's going to be bad bad times in both directions, but something may be worse. One direction may be worse worse than the other. So I just understood, you know my own decisions and, and making the right decision and how that panned out for me in comparison to making the wrong decision. So, you know, it's all about what I'm saying on a micro level. It's all about, it's all about, gener it's all about breaking the generational chain and creating generational wealth, wealth in a positive way. And that's not only financially, that's, that's um, in, in realms of education. That's, you know, in, in, in the same realm of uh, physical health and, and all these things. So, so yeah, the, that's, that's what I have to say about, you know, my approach with uh, generational trauma and generational conflict. Like it, things will make you, will, will, things can change you. Things can change you, but doesn't mean that you, doesn't mean that you, you can't change the route that you're on. You know, you always have a decision. You're never on a, you're never on an upward moving escalator you're on a ladder climbing up. You can go down. You can get off this for a second and think about your next decision. You know, so, yeah. What has been some of the most interesting or surprising feedback that you've got from your work? Um, the feedback that I've gotten from my work. Initially, uh, initially everyone's like, man, I love that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, majority of the time it stays there <laughs> it stays there that you know 
uh, a lot of, I, I just chalk that up to, you know, people, people, you know, not, not knowing how to approach art because then, you know, there's, there's a, du there's duality to it. You know, you can be an artist and, uh, people will, will, will come up to you and they'll say something insightful about your work. And there's some people which might be the majority that will just tell you how good it looks, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm fine with, you know, with both. I'm fine. I'm fine with both. I'm fine with having conversations and it impacting people in that way. And I'm also fine with, you know, it just being something aesthetically pleasing because things like things that are aesthetically pleasing can, you know, can brighten anybody's day. You know, it can be something that they can just take home with, with themselves. But, you know, I, I would rather, you know, you, I'd rather you feel both, you know, I know. Yeah. But that's, that's pretty much pretty people will get into deep conversations about um, my art after I explain, you know, what they've gone, what, what I've gone through and what the art means to me. Um, and, uh, and by doing that, they then share stories of their own. So, you know, something's working, something's working in regards to the message and something's working um, in regards to the look and my choice. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Pooh, we're now going to take some questions. So if anybody has any questions for Monte, please do jump into the comments, whether that is on Instagram or, sorry, on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, just jump on in with your question, and we'll try to get to you before we wrap this up. So one final question. So art and activism have been kind of one, you know, two things that have coexisted for centuries. How do you, what do you see next for yourself? Do you see yourself using uh, your creativity to express what's happening to you know, getting out there with work that does tell a story of this defining moment or do you see yourself going in a different direction um yeah i see i see myself uh growing as not growing but i see i, I see that i that i have grown as as an artist in in um i've grown into this new direction where i'm where I'm now playing with uh, film. I'm now playing with uh, the, 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 creative side, the creative side of me behind the lens. And I, it's taking me nine years to do it. <laughs> it's taking me nine years to kind of courageously, like, you know, get out there and just, you know, do that, do that side of my artistry and tell a story in that way. And it starts with that, uh, that, that short that I created called the understanding. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, just see myself growing. The next step though, that, that I hope happens, that I just, you know, hope is like sculpture. Right. Um, I, I do, I do want to take a shot at that. Um, uh, and also um, I've been planning, I've been not planning, but I have coming on the way, <laughs> coming on the way, I have some, I'm I'm getting into design in regards to apparel. I'm getting into design um, at, in regards to architecture. This 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 quarantine has given me an opportunity to play with a number of mediums and to aspire to a number of mediums, and uh, that's that's where I'm heading. Now I'm a I'm a filmmaker now, and I'm even playing. I'm even planning on uh, creating a. Uh, uh, a musical project too. So, you know, and these are all sides of myself that I've learned from my family, you know, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurial side, that's my grandmother. Um, that's my grandmother and my mother, the design, my mom, um, photography and film, my dad, uh, my music, my brother, art, my sister, and my second oldest brother, you know, these are all things that I think the quarantine gave me an opportunity to see and now practice. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we certainly look up, look forward to keeping up with your, uh, your next creative ventures. And uh, you know, we really uh, appreciate you coming on the show for uh, such a candid conversation this morning. Uh, thank you so much. And if we could just let thank you know where they could find out more about you, what is your, the best place to, to find you online? So the best place to find me online uh, is you can you can check my 
Instagram out. It's Monty Babor. So that's Monty, M-O-N-T-E-E, B-O-B-B-O-R. Um, that's my IG. And you can check my website out. It's the same name, but just with a dot com. All right, folks, I have added those, both of those uh, locations to the chat. So do be sure to go and check out Monty's work. It is really beautifully, beautifully executed. Um, and obviously with this wonderful uh, story behind it as well. So Monty, thank you again. It's been great having you. Thank you for sharing this morning with me. Thank you, Rachel. It was great. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, folks, we'll be back tomorrow. Same time, 11 a.m. That is our show for today. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Peace out.